A clarification, I am the former maintainer of Selenium ID. Um, there was a little too much irony in my life for trying to make the product better and then telling people not to use it. Um, so I pass that off onto people who have a much better you know, vision for it and the drive. Um, I am a Selenium consultant by trade. I have the Selenium commit bit. Um, I'm the only person with the commit bit that is not employed by a larger organization. Which, so I feel the wrath of all the bad marketing de decisions that Jason and Simon make. Um, so yeah, so I'm in town for a conference and then Ashley saw that I was in town and was like, hey, you know, you should probably come speak because I haven't spoken enough this week already. Um, if you were, I don't think anybody here, aside from Ian, was in the San Jose meetup at Tuesday. This is the exact same talk. Um, different crowd. Different crowd. It's all of an hour away. Um, anyway, so this is a slightly differently labeled talk than what was on the meetup because the one that was on the meetup page was, the title was thought up when I was really, really tired and thought I was funnier than I was and then realized that that talk would be about 20 minutes long, and I've got to fill longer than 20 minutes. So tonight I'm going to talk about using a proxy for your automation and about the JavaScript executor, which I think is going to be the part of WebDriver that people exploit the most uh, in the coming months and years. Um, so that was the only picture in the deck. I'm sorry. I have code and stuff. Um, it's not Node, it's PHP. I apologize to San Francisco. Um, the, so how many people routinely run their web driver scripts through some sort of proxy? Or do they just directly go out to their app? Anyone, anyone, that's about what I expected. Um, I'm quite convinced now that Running your automation through a proxy should just be par for the course, and it is what we do. Um, and I will show you why I've come to that conclusion. Um, and I'm ahead of myself with the slides already. So why do we want to do this? Namely, because slow scripts suck. Um, that being a technical term. Uh, the other technical term that I'm going to throw around is third-party crap. Um, too much of what I'm seeing as a consultant when I'm working with people's um, automation stacks is there is all this third party stuff that is loaded into the page that has nothing to do with the functionality they're trying to automate. So um, quick uh, survey to find out who I'm going to insult. Anyone from Twitter? Anyone Twitter? How to speed up your website in one easy step remove the Twitter integration. <laughs> Anyone from Facebook? Facebook? That's step two. Uh, step three and continuous is Omniture and all the other tracking pickle, pixels, all the analytics, all the follow your you know, mouse movements, spyware, scumware stuff that your marketing and analytics department forces you to put in. Um, so there's an easy way to remove it. You can ask the developers, or if you are the developers, to put it in a feature switch. So that way, when you're live in your automation environment, you just turn it off, and it doesn't even render. Um, feature switches are fantastic tools, and you should be using them throughout your application anyways. But they are wonderful to turn off all this stuff when you're doing automation. But often, either the development team just says, no, we're not going to do that, because we've got all this other value-added stuff that is, a, well, allegedly value-added stuff that we're doing. Um, or the product owners say, well, you can't do that. We need, the, we need the ad revenue. And it's just like, yes, that's wonderful. But they're filtering out all the stuff that originates inside your domain anyways. So you're not getting ad revenue. All you're doing is making each script slower by about two minutes, times 1,000 scripts, times 50 runs a day. And instantly, we are um, you know, getting, we're slowing down the information flow that we're trying to get. And that's primarily why we're doing the automation, to get information. 
So by using a proxy, you can get rid of um, all that other stuff by just blacklisting it. Um, and I, I'll show you how to do this in a bit. Um, there's another reason why you would use a proxy is issue 141, which is the Selenium issue 141, which, crazy enough, I have loaded here. Um, this is perhaps one of the more toxic issues involved in the Selenium project right now. Let's resize this so it actually fits on the page. And it starts out very nice with, please, sir, I would like to know the response code from my page. <laughs> Which, first of all, is kind of naive about uh, an understanding about HT how HTTP works. It could get you the response code of the original get, but the average page loads 50 or 60 other elements on it. And you probably care about those as well. It's not just that the page worked, because the page could come back with a 200, and it's actually broken because the developers didn't understand that a broken thing should not return a 200 uh, response code. Um, so it goes on, and there's been issues that have been merged into it because they say the same thing. And it goes on, and uh, apparently, uh, sometimes it says, no, we're not going to do it, and we're closing it. Um, because there's no consistent browser independent way of getting this information, and it's really naive. And, but they say, but we want it. Uh, and we say, no. <laughs> and, and then there's a nice technical discussion from one of the committers, and we say, no. But, but, but we want it, and this over here can get it, and this is why I need it. And it's like, well, this is naive, and no, you don't really want it. And it goes on, it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. Um, and, and there's even conversations going on in the thread now. It's like, yeah, way to go. This is exactly what we want. We should do this. It's like, that's awesome. It's open source. We'd like a patch. And go ahead, um, prove us wrong. The people who have written the drivers, show us how you can get this independently. Um, and, and the answer is, of course, that you can't. Um, but, you know, little, you know, not that I'm partial to going on rants, um, shockingly, the users are wrong. Um, so using a proxy, you can get this information. Um, and it can be done in a browser independent way. Um, so you can check for things like um, 404s. Uh, actually, apparently, I don't have the demo slide. So let's actually start showing some code. Um, but 404s follows up on the issue 141. Because when I'm doing automation, I care about things like the 404s. That's wonderful that I was getting 200s and checking for the presence of 200s. I expect 200s. It's when I'm getting things like 404s and the various 300 type codes that I start to get cranky as a tester. Why am I getting a 404? It's not showing up in the browser because all the splash graphics are showing up. But why are we making extra calls into things that are 404s? Has a third party that we have integrated with changed their integration and, and we have not known about it? Why did we integrate with them in the first place? Is this something that we should care about? Um, so let's um, start blacklisting some stuff to begin with. So um, I, ha I write automation frameworks that I can drop into people's um, organizations. Um, and one of the uh, the sample page that I use to sort of test my application is the men's dress shirt page deep inside eBay. Um, I'm not sure why I chose it. I just randomly chose one. Um, and it, my examples more or less continue to work, except when eBay changes things without consulting me. Uh, it's uh, shocking. Um, I actually know the person in charge of front end QA, so I could actually find out when they're changing things, but they don't consult me. And occasionally my uh, pages break. Um, so here we have this nice little like page. And it amuses me that there are 556 likes of the men's dress shirt page. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm not sure why I would like, yes, I like <laughs> men's dress shirts. Like, I can understand some sort of very honed in comic book search or something. But men's dress shirt with a spread collar. Um, <laughs> And so this page, you know, is decently fast, you know, to show up. But you'll notice that Facebook's shockingly the last thing to show up. So let's just pick on Facebook because they're not here. Um, and here's a 
script that I should probably go like this so that people can see it. Um, and it's using page objects and it's, uh, well, it's PHP, all sorts of good stuff in there like dynamic test, genera test suite generation. But you'll notice that I have thrown in a blacklist. So I am basically uh, sending Facebook to the, the pit of doom when this loads. Um, and there's two parts to this. I'm going to assign it an error code, uh, or a response code of 306, which is unused in the HTTP 1.1 spec. It's one of these reserved ones that used to be used in like HTTP.5. Um, so in theory, not too many websites are returning this. So I can look in my logs and find out what, exactly how effective my blacklist was. Um, yeah, I'm so getting ahead of my slides. So we're going to correct this later and we'll just sort of wing it. Um, so let's see how good we were at setting everything up. So I'm running this through the remote web driver. As a general rule, I run all my stuff through the remote web driver because then I can send it off into the cloud without rewriting my scripts. I'm also using a proxy that uh, Patrick Lightbody, when he was running Browser Mob, wrote for his app, crazy enough, called the Browser Mob Proxy. Uh, it has an API that allows me to do things like create a blacklist or a whitelist. Um, I can also make it fake out a really slow network link um, so you can act uh, find out what it's like uh, for your poor consultant when he's in a hotel with a really bad wireless link. Um, and you know, once you've had that experience, this is when you start to explore shutting things off. Um, before I had the proxy, I would just modify my host file, and that works, but it's kind of a machine-dependent solution, and if you forget to change your host file back, it gets really confusing why Facebook is down. And you're like, awesome, Facebook has crashed, I'm going to tweet about it, and everybody's like, no, it's up, you idiot. And it's like, oh, that's right. Uh, I told it that Facebook was localhost. Um, <laughs> So the way the browser mob proxy works is it listens on a single port and you make a request saying, I would like a new proxy object. And it gives you a new port. So I'm starting on, I'm running it on port uh, 9090. The first client to access it is really gonna be on 9091, the next one 9092. So it's not as direct as just pointing your browser at a proxy like you would to get beyond, outside of uh, restrictive corporate Orwellian firewalls. Um, so there are clients for Py Python, PHP, Ruby, and whatnot that will integrate it with your Selenium uh, web driver browser objects. Um, so in theory, we are at this page and we do PHP, just like Ruby. What's the group that I want? I want a blacklist. And I haven't run this today, so we'll see if it works. It worked on Tuesday. Sort of rule number one of presentations is don't do live coding. Rule number zero is make sure your demos work. Uh, 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 loading, we melt the wireless. Hey, eBay is loading, eBay is static. Look at that, Facebook is no longer there, it's slowing down my site. So eBay is actually pretty good for third party crap because they're big enough that they've got their own crap. Um, but if your site has a million little Omniture pixels and stuff, for automation purposes, get rid of them. They don't matter. Now. Um, because nobody's looking at the analytics in test anyways. Um, so that, you know, blacklisting is, you know, once you have it, you know, the client installed, it really is, air quotes, that easy to just add the big blacklist. I've got one client, the blacklist is about 40 things and we can, we've taken their page loads down from two minutes to about 20 seconds. Um, and that, when we're trying to run on every single commit across all the browsers, massively saves us time and money because we're, you know, especially if you're using third-party services, 
um, to run your automation where time literally is money. The way this integration happens is all WebDriver browser drivers, way too many similar sounding words, they have this sense of capabilities. And right now, all they have is desired capabilities to say, I would like you to do this with the W3C draft of the WebDriver spec. There is this notion of required capabilities now. So you can say, light up this browser, and the required platform is Windows. And if you point it at a node that is Mac or Linux or something, then it's going to just not light up that browser. Um, one of the capabilities is an HTTP proxy um, using the client that integrates with the web drive, what the, with the browser mob proxy, you get the port that it's going to be listening on, you plug that into the capabilities object, lights up and magic happens for you. So again, I'm so far ahead of my slides with the little demo there. Uh, so we have the browser mob proxy. There are lots of other proxies out on the market. Uh, some of them open source, some of them commercial. The key thing that you want is that you need to have an API you can hit uh, in, inside the proxy. Um, Patrick Lightbody is long associated with the Selenium project, so the sort of de facto one that works with Selenium is the browser mob proxy. Talked about getting the port, showed blacklists. Blacklists are awesome. Um, but to, to deal with the uh, the notion of response codes, what the browser mob proxy can also do is collect um, all the traffic that's passing through the proxy into a, a, I guess it's a standard format called HAR or HTTP archive. And um, crazy enough, I can show that. So I was at Adobe on Tuesday doing the same talk and had I been you know, a little more prepared, I would have done it for here. That way we could have commented on the performance of our host's website. Um, so this is Adobe's uh, HAR file. It's just JSON. Uh, there are you know, some boilerplate stuff, like what was the browser we were using? Who created it? The version of the, uh, of the HAR file, which this is actually a lie because BrowserMob kind of does 1.2 some bugs that I've logged and I've talked to Patrick about them and hopefully somebody will fix them, but it's Java and I don't want to do it myself. Um, so inside a HAR file, there's this notion of a page um, and each page has many entries associated with it because as we all know and understand HTTP, it's not just the initial page that, it, you, that gets loaded uh, when you access something, it's all the images, all the CSS, all the JS, all the tracking pixels, all this, that, and the other thing. Um, and so those are called entries, and they match back to our, uh, so a page has an ID, an entry has a page ref. So you can, in your HAR file, have multiple pages recorded, and this thing can grow enormous, but sort of a good idea is when you know that you're going to analyze the HAR file, start it before you go to a page, go to the page, end, it, end the collection, and then analyze it. Rather than having this enormous HAR file that takes time to process, keep it small, keep it tight. Um, so there's, you know, it tells you what the request looks like. In this case, you know, this entry that's on the screen now is just the original get. And it told us, hey, it moved permanently. So anytime there's a redirect around that as a tester, I wonder what's going on because a redirect cause slows down our site for our users. Um, I went to, somebody on Twitter posted something from fail blog. So of course I have to click it. Um, and it was pretty awesome. He put a dinosaur prints underneath this kid's sandbox while they were away and then filled it up with sand and didn't tell them. So they're going to be digging around one day and get to the bottom and there's like a dinosaur print. And they're, you know, what he didn't think about is they're going to put all the sand from in the sandbox onto the lawn. But at the bottom is dinosaur prints and like a Tyrannosaurus skull. It's, it's awesome. But when you go to it, you redirect about 12 times before you get to the actual page. It's like, why are we doing all these redirects? Can't we just go to the page? 
but there was like, a, let's authenticate, but I'm not authenticating. I don't work for them. Why am I authenticating? And then I go just to the non-authenticate and it's just crazy. As testers, I notice these things. Um, so like, there's a lot of entries in this. We can scroll for a while. And so now we're getting, look, we're trusted in the EU. And how many microseconds did it take? Well, it took 13 seconds to receive it, but 63 seconds to connect. And we were blocked from one microsecond and we waited 82 microseconds. So you can start to analyze these things based upon your own determinations of speed. Um, and it's got, of course, all our blessed response codes. So if we, there's a, look, more PHP. Um, but it needs to be biggerized. So in this case, we're going to create a new HAR file and we're going to give it a page ID of Adobe homepage. We're going to open the main homepage and then we're going to stop the collection. We are going to get that back. And so in theory, then we would just take our, our dollar har file variable and pass it into my little har file parsing into an object for nice manipulation uh, object. Except the browser mob proxy doesn't actually produce valid har files as per the spec. And I was implementing the spec, not browser mob's variant of the spec. So we've kind of hacked around it and said, we're going to collect the har file and then ignore it for tonight. Um, and actually use this modified HAR file that I've cleaned up to be valid. Uh, we're then going to iterate through all the entries associated with the Adobe homepage and check for the status. If it's 404, we're going to push it to our array. And at the end, we're going to assert that uh, there are no 404s. And that's not the directory. This is the directory. Yes.php. It blinks really fast, or not really because we're on slowish wireless. But it's like, boom, it loads. And it passed because there was no 404s. Um, you know, we could do something ridiculous like, hey, let's make sure there was no 200s. <laughs> oops. Yeah, oops. Uh, this is what happens if you, say, are automating eBay and you blacklist eBay, which for a lark, I did. I'm like, why is it not working? Why is it not working? Well, let's block everything. Oh, it's working. Um, so we failed um, because zero is not 63. Uh, all right, so there's our HAR files. Fantastically useful thing to collect information. and. You know, so I would just run my scripts through the proxy all the time. It's transparent, essentially, to the automation. Um, and that way, it's available when we want it. Oh, let's get this information. Why is this page slow? Let's analyze it. Uh, but I wouldn't analyze every single time we hit a page, but maybe one of our entire script, or of our suite, analyzes the page for error codes. So we talked about the HAR file. It's just JSON. Talked about pages, only collect one at a time. It makes it for easier parsing. Uh, and pages contain entries. Entries contain timing. They contain the, the status response. Um, it also has a section for caching. So I haven't figured out, I haven't played around with this too much, but in th I have this notion that I could start checking it to make sure that we have a certain percentage of cache hits. Um, because that's another thing we could care about when we're automating. Uh, it's not just are we getting the right thing, but are we getting the right thing served from the right place? And so that's sort of part, the, you know, the first half of the talk about the proxy. So we're, I'm also going to talk about the JavaScript executor tonight. And the JavaScript executor is not really well known, but it is ridiculously powerful in what it can do. Um, this is the hammer. Um, you can brute force your way through anything with the JavaScript executor, because what it allows you to do is execute, well, it's a JavaScript executor, so wait for it. It executes JavaScript uh, <laughs> arbitrarily. So you can say, run this. 
And so if there's something that you think that uh, needs to be done that WebDriver won't allow you to do, such as click an invisible uh, element, you really can do it this way. Um, now, if you're going to do something like that, think about why you're trying to click that invisible element. Your user is not clicking your invisible element. So uh, why are you trying to do it in the browser-based automation where in theory you're trying to emul emulate the user? Um, so my sort of pat phrase for this is poke with the JS, but don't fix things. And fix probably should have been in quotes. Um, and by poking, uh, oh, well, we'll get to what poking means in this case. So um, there are two variants of the JavaScript executor. There is the synchronous version and the asynchronous version. And apparently, even the async version will block. So you're running something that is essentially fire and forget, but you wait around to, for it to finish. And I don't really understand this, but Luke explained it to me on Tuesday. So if you really need to know, understand the difference between synchronous JavaScript execution and asynchronous JavaScript execution that acts like synchronous JavaScript execution, <laughs> um, hop onto the IRC channel and ask Luke. Because uh, in theory, he can explain it. And this is being recorded, so I'm putting him on the spot to do it. Um, so widgets. So one of the reasons why you would use a JavaScript ex executor is this whole infection of JavaScript widgets that is taking over the web, post web 2.0 world that we live in. Whoops. Um, how many people use a GWT or UE or ExtJS or one of these? It looks very pretty as a web element, but it's not a web element. It's styled div. Anyone? You're lying. You're all using it. <laughs> Anyone manufacture it? Please don't admit it, because then I'll, it'll just be bad. Um, these are the bane of my existence from an automation perspective. HTML is nice. Let's use HTML. If all you're doing is using a select, but you want to have the corners rounded, now, it, now it's like, well, it's really a, just a JavaScript object that's attached to a div. And so a click isn't really a click because you're just clicking a div. And it's now maybe or maybe not firing the click event, depending on whether or not the browser is in focus or if it's on the right platform with the right flag switched. So what you need to do instead is um, something suspiciously like, if I look in the right spot, raw. Uh, it's not colored very nicely, but let's say you have a wonderful JavaScript widget that looks like a select box, but is really just a JS object that's pulling stuff from a dynamically generated hidden select object behind the scenes, you need to do this. <laughs> so you need to first find the parent div that holds all the other magical divs. Well, actually, it's a visible input that's not really an input, and two hidden inputs that are, again, not really inputs. Um, and then look for the one that isn't named in a certain way, grab the name attribute from that one, then look in this JavaScript global array for a thing that matches that name, and then iterate through a different array on that object to find all the options. Instead of just looking at the options list, you've got to get all this stuff. Um, we can do even fun QA things, like notice that they're spelling array with one R there, and it's two R's down there, because they can't even be consistent on the same object. Um, so this is a blast of JS that is being fired every single time I need to interact with this JavaScript widget. And I haven't even started to deal with the calendar control that does the same thing. Um, I'm not looking forward to that, but I expect that's how I'm going to lose my entire week next week. Um, what's cool about the JavaScript uh, executor is that it can also pass in arguments to it. There's magic that happens in, inside WebDriver. And so by saying argument zero, it's the first argument that I passed into it. 
Um, in this case, it's just the string that I'm passing in. But if you, if you pass in a web driver element, then it will do the magic pulling it from the DOM and using it in this variable. So there is some pretty clever stuff that goes on in there. Um, but this is, I fear, the future that we are going to be moving into. The more JavaScript widgets that get pulled out into the future, uh, that get pulled out, we're going to have to do this. Um, to, we talked about the document, talk the element. So the JavaScript widget is also how you'll have to solve the problem of flash and flex in WebDriver. So far as I knew, nobody had solved this problem yet, or at least people had thought about it, but not actually had written any code. And you know, usually the way to get things out of me is to ask it in such a way to pique my curiosity. How would you do this? I've thought about doing it this way. Would this work? And it's like, I don't know. Let's try. Then I try a little more, and I try a little more, and I try a little more. And then I've lost a weekend, but I have working code. Um, so Flexpilot. Um, Flexpilot was written by Adam Christian, who's not here today, uh, and somebody else who I cannot remember. Uh, but it is how you expose the internals of your Swift file um, to be able to be scripted. It's not just this big black box now. It's a big black box that has things that are exposed. And I've, I've, I've got the code. I've read it. I have no idea how it works. I just trust that if I do the right thing, it works. Uh, and the right thing looks suspiciously like not that page. And we are, whoop, flex store. This is the right, do the right thing is suspiciously looks like this. Add in the init of your Swift, load this other one, and magic happens. It quite, at this point, it really is magic. Um, I could have put voodoo or similar things, but it all gets, you know, stuff happens that I don't understand, and then I can automate it. And so then we go over here, flip to this window here. So to access um, flex stuff, I have an element that I am passing in. Uh, and that is the element to my Swift file. And then I'm going to, here are the sorts of things that Flexpilot adds into your Swift object that we can call. It's just JavaScript. So we say my object dot get text value from over here. And it returns it back out into my script. Um, I have only done this for uh, PHP, but to implement it in Python or Ruby or Java or anything is more or less easy peasy because it's the idiomatic way of executing this. This string is not going to change. It's how you call that string into WebDriver that will need to be ported to the other languages. The hard part is figuring out what the JS is that needs to be called. And through trial and error and reading code that I just don't understand, uh, um, I was able to do a bunch of it. And again, crazy enough, I have a demo. Uh, here is the little demo that the Flexpilot group, group is using. I don't know if they built this themselves or just stole it and rebranded it. Um, I think I'd like the story better if they just stole it and rebranded it. Um, so we can go to, so we go PHP unit test flex. loads the flex store, it does a bunch of stuff, which so far as I know, up until a couple weeks ago, nobody had been able to do in WebDriver. So it is now a solved problem, and solved in an open source manner at that, not a commercial plugin that costs lots of money. Because being from the Selenium project, it is, I am openly and aggressively um, open source. So where are we? So we executed some Flexpilot stuff. 
Oh, uh, anybody from Zynga? Anyone? Please install this so I can win at farming. Uh, I, one of the things I do is I look at all the Swift files that I encounter to see if there's automation hooks because you can be darn sure that I will exploit, exploit them as soon as I find them. Um, and so one of the, and this is actually one of the concerns that people have when they're integrating with uh, their Flex apps in this manner, like, oh, well, what if it leaks out into production? Well, apparently, uh, if you just don't have that file on your production servers where you say it's going to be, it just silently doesn't load and none of the hooks are exposed. So you put that file on your automation environment, your test environment, your staging environment, just not production. Um, and then it doesn't leak out. Um, so now we've solved the problem of JS widgets and uh, Flex and Flash. In theory, Silverlight is the same thing. I just don't know if anybody's written the, the magic bit to expose all the hooks for Silverlight. Um, there used to be a Selenium Silverlight project for remote control, but it didn't seem to be used by anybody, which in itself we could take as a little bit of uh, market research and leave it at that. Um, so we've now solved things until we hit HTML5. Um, and HTML5's got some really cool things. And it's kind of sad that I have opinions about parts of an HTML spec. Um, you know, that's a certain level of geekness that you need to achieve to like, this is cool. Um, like the data attribute part of um, the HTML5 spec is ridiculously powerful. Uh, for those of you who don't know, an attribute can be named data dash anything you want, um, and it will be perfectly legal and valid HTML. Right now, if you do that in HTML4, data whatever, it will render, but if you want to parse it for adherence to the standards, it will fail. Uh, but the fact that I see HTML that has IDs that are duplicated on every single row of a table means that, in general, the community doesn't care about valid HTML. <laughs> uh, until you start to automate and have somebody like me automating it and getting really cranky. Um, so HTML5. The part that everybody talks about when they say HTML5 is Canvas. They don't mean any, the audio tag. They don't mean the media tag. They don't mean any of these things. They really mean Canvas. Um, and Canvas is just as evil a black box as Flash and Flex was into the previous generation of rich text site websites. You, it's just another JavaScript object, just as our annoying widgets were just another JavaScript object. Only this one has your entire application inside it. So um, this is hard. Um, and this unfortunately is not something we can solve in a technical manner. This is solved through uh, education and documentation. There are ways to make your app more automatable than not. For instance, you need to have bookmarkable URLs that are exposed to the outside world. And that allows you to hop through the various steps to get to a point in your app. Um, but you also have to expose the, the JavaScript method calls that tell me the internal state, allow me to poke it in this manner. Um, to If I have my canvas object dot first name equals Adam, that should then put that in the field in the canvas object. So it looks like we're interacting with it, but we're not really. We're just pulling the little puppet strings from behind the scenes. But that's how we automate Canvas. That's just about the only way we can automate Canvas. Unless, of course, you are moving your mouse to a certain pixel and then to another pixel and another pixel and sending characters with the mouse at this point. And well, that doesn't work as soon as you change resolutions on your page. Um, you know, we tried this in the late 90s, and it didn't work. Uh, I don't want to see us try that again. I know that we as an industry will, because we don't learn from our mistakes. Um, which is why we have black boxes like Canvas. Um, but something that is easier, so an, or another part of the HTML5 spec is this whole media. You have audio and you have video. Um, and that is easy to automate because that is not black boxes. It's a 
box that has defined controls like play, pause, skip. All these things are defined in the spec. And this is, should actually be easy in, again, quotes, because if you follow the spec, it's easy. Nobody actually follows the spec. Everybody wants this lovely third-party JS wrapper around the HTML5 stuff. So you actually have to reverse engineer whichever audio playback, uh, audio little jukebox that is installed on your app to figure out, well, what is the object called? And what's the movie called? Can I play it? Oh, I don't call play on the, uh, that, the movie object? That would be too simple. I have to call it on the uh, volume controls to adjust the object and set it to 55% instead of just by the spec. But you know, they can skin it and it looks wonderful. Um, whole parts of the industry that should not exist. <laughs> um, so to integrate with, say, the video tag, it looks uh, supports video. All right, so the way video works, see, got set. Oh, I was being clever when I wrote this. That's never good. Uh, all right, so here I'm being clever by overloading. Ah, here's, here's play. This will be a good one. Uh, the rest of it I was overloading gets and sets. Um, but in order to play the object, I'm, by resizing, I totally lose my place. So again, the JavaScript executor can take an, an, an element that's passed in uh, and drop it into the actual JavaScript. So argument zero in this case is my movie file. Uh, and I'm going to load it. Well, okay, so I was going to show place. Why don't I show the play? So then I call the play method on it, and I call the pause method on it, and it does what it kind of tells you to do because the spec's not that bad. And there is just this very limited set of things that it can do. Um, so we have a video test, which will... Will this actually work? Ooh, time will tell. With no. uh, well, let's try and run another demo. Oops. So we go to this lovely site that's uh, oh, it doesn't work because it loaded Firefox. Where is the video, that, the test that had Chrome? Let's see, because heaven forbid that all my demos work. That was going way too easy. It'll be a mess. All right, so what you were supposed to see is this video, this 25 second video Oh, right, slow wireless. Um, of a cat chasing a laser pointer. And, I, uh, and you know, I, I mentioned on Tuesday, I'm not sure what's more amusing, the cat chasing the laser pointer for 25 seconds or somebody actually recorded it for 25 seconds. Because 25 seconds is a long time, just be ha, 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 ha. So, um, yes. I'm not going to try and dig for the, the script because my temp directory is just way too messy um, and I'll never find it. Uh, but trust me, I have a script that will load it and play and get all the information about the width and height and, and everything of it. Um, and the cool thing about you know, HTML5 video is I can block Flash on this page. Um, so, oh, I remember what I was going to show, another video. What was that? When I was talking about Canvas. So, where to go, where to go? This is Canvas being automated. The code is available for this. That helicopter is moving on its own through the powers of computers and web driver. Uh, it's, you know, kind of boring right now because 
the obstacles are not very scary looking, but now we start to have the ups and downs. And so this was presented at SeleumConf 2011. Uh, the code's all open source, so you can see how they integrated with the game, how they pulled it, um, and it's, you know, kind of impressive how long it goes on without crashing. Now they also, the actual game has like stalactites and stalagmites, and they've disabled those. Um, but, you know, for proof of concept, this is pretty impressive. Um, but it, it illustrates um, the sort of things that we as an industry are going to have to do to both automate uh, canvas elements and to make them automatable. And we're almost done. Well, in theory, it gets the same score every single time. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, close. Oh, it just wasn't fast enough. Um, but, you know, that's pretty impressive. Uh, so that talk's floating around. Uh, so that was easy. So we executed. Oh, look at that. And I don't know. Eh, it was like 50 minutes. And we started early, so that we should put us really at like 10 after 8. So I'm only five minutes early ending where I was supposed to end. Um, so in theory, we've got, you know, the, the talk is booked until 8.30, and it's like 8 o'clock now. And we, so we have tons of time to do sort of Q&A, ask me questions that I don't know, ask me to write code that's going to fail horribly. Generally, try and prompt snark out of me. Oh, oh, we can do clapping now. Somebody wants to clap. Okay, there is a question over here. Um, I have a question about Flash Flex. Um, did you try to automate for download files, uh, uploads, for example, that opens window? Just like Windows, Windows. Like I have Windows. not tried to do that. I have literally just done the proof of concept. Of, uh, so the question was, with the Flash and Flex, have I tried to automate a Flash uh, uh, file uploader? And I have not yet. But um, in theory, um, it should be possible. Something. I don't know. Now we're using WebDriver to do that, or okay. So, and what, did you have FlexPilot installed? No, I have. We are using um, Flex Selenium APIs, right? And, and then we're using um, some Flex WebDriver kind of wrapper on those APIs of Adobe APIs. Okay. So I, I, this is the first I've heard about Flex WebDriver. So there's apparently another solution that people have solved. Um, but still, we couldn't make a file. It just needs better marketing. We just used the SQL for this. I couldn't. <coughs> yeah, and um, you know, sometimes for automation purposes, shut off as much security as you can. All right. So this is don't be afraid to modify your app to make it automatable in the automation environment. So if there's a way to turn off the various security sandboxes. And you know, maybe you know how to do it. Maybe somebody else in the org knows it. Maybe Adobe knows how to do it. Uh, you know, look for that sort of thing. But if you can't upload it, then don't use a flash uploader. Use something that's... No, you're using SQL only for upload, and then whatever after upload, it's a, the rest flash, we can work with it. I mean, add file, remove files, right. everything. Then it's wow. okay. I have some pretty hefty biases against flash in general, but... Um, so any answer you get will probably have a heavy dose of bias, but I have not tried to automate the file uploader. Um, and, but, you know, blatant consultant speak now. Um, if somebody is willing to pay me, I'm happy to explore it. <laughs> Anyone else? Over? So you had a, a HAR file earlier in yep. the demonstration with the JSON representation. And I noticed you had some redirects in there, but um, I didn't see where it was redirecting to. Does it not save location headers and other things like that? Or how, how do you get that? All right. So move permanently, response, content, headers. So. See, there's a redirect girl, but it's, it's yeah. Well, I assume it didn't say redirect to nowhere. 
So yeah, what is 301? Off the top of my head, what's... And it could just be... <laughs> it, and it could just be, again, this is just the HAR file as produced by the browser mod proxy, which has some bugs in it. And it could just be that it's not capturing it. For instance, um, the browser mod proxy doesn't put in the um, <coughs> excuse me the timing section if it's trying to uh, get that little icon in the location bar um, because the response is a certain thing that it doesn't know how to parse, and so it's like oh something went wrong and there's no timings for it, which is not valid har file syntax. It need, it's a mandatory section, and if there is no timings, it's supposed to be all be negative one, is just what the spec says. So I would have expected to see um, the location probably somewhere around there. Or two lines down where it says redirect girl. And it might oh, even better. That might be even better. <laughs> all right, so let's see. I don't know how to do comments in JSON. Let's, so let's just break this and say, no to me, why is this empty? And then I'm gonna forget about it and try and run the script and it's gonna explode saying not valid JSON and I'm gonna wonder why and not scroll down far enough and be really confused. All right. So yes, I don't know. I have a question about, you mentioned caches. Yep. And Something I'd want to try and automate is um, hitting a page twice. What is getting cached at that level? What level of things are being cached then? Uh, yeah, like there is all sorts of interesting things you can do with cache, and in this case, it's returning nothing. Is so it stored in the har file. Like this it's supposed to be. So like if we, uh, well, let's switch to Safari. Open a new window. Uh, in one of the better uh, URLs software is hard.com. Um, and we go cache. So that is what is supposed to be there. Um, and I don't know if it then would be valuable to you what is provided or if we need to figure out some other way. Uh, one thing I've been, I tried to do, but then had to do other work was um, when I was at, you know, when I, before I went all consultancy, was try and poke memcache to see what its contents were and its various hit counters um, and include that in my scripts. But it wasn't really designed with that purpose in mind. And so I, you know, went and was like, oh, this is hard. I'm not supposed to be doing this, and I'll probably get in trouble if I do, so I'm not going to do it. I'll just put this in the back of my mind. So if somebody has a cache server that has all these stats in a nice JSON-y, restful way, that would be an interesting thing to blog about, and then let me know. Anyone? I'm that brilliant that there was three questions. I have answered all your problems. You are going to everybody be running your stuff through uh, through a browser, through through a cache of some sort. I have a, a question. All right. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> the person in the room that may know more than me. <laughs> have you seen incompatibility between a, a browser mod proxy and different Firefox versions? Uh, issues like that, like putting the browser, the proxy in the middle should be transparent. That's not as awesome every time. I have not seen that yet, but I have my rig wired up to really only just use one version of Firefox. So even though I have multiple, multiple versions of Firefox installed and available, <laughs> by the way, the plural of Firefox is Firefoxen. Uh, uh, so, but, you know, the way you do this on the Mac is you create folders for them and stuff them all in and then symlink sim -link deep inside the, uh, the binary, but then you have the one in the applications directory, then because WebDriver looks in the applications directory for Firefox.app. Um, so you move that sim link around to where you want it to go. If you want it at Firefox 7, it goes here. Firefox 14, it goes down here. Um, and you can avoid 
uh, bleeding edge stuff if you're running Aurora and what have you. So no, I have not seen it, but I have not looked for it. Anyone? Carb comas have hit in. Mm, pizza. <laughs> All right, we are done early, but thank you for coming.